Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Misak Jin, a senior research fellow at um, Korean Research Institute for Vocational Education and Training. Uh, this morning, I'm so honored to have this chance to moderate uh, this very special and important um, session uh, that is keeping tradition while approaching to modern education. I think uh, this uh, session is so important, especially for countries like Korea, which has struggled for making balance between a tradition and rapid change. Indeed, um, Korea has a 15, 50 centuries long history and experience, uh, and experience of uh, rapid change since the last centuries. Uh, for this session, uh, we are having very, very you know, special, distinguished uh, speaker, uh, headmaster of uh, Eton College in the United Kingdom, uh, Mr. Little. Uh, let me introduce uh, Mr. Little very briefly. Uh, Mr. Little, he himself is a graduate from Eton, and he was educated uh, at uh, Cambridge, and he, ha he has taught kids quite a long time, and has been uh, headmaster at several high schools before he became headmaster of Eton in 2002. Altogether, he has worked in the field of education for more than 30 years. Uh, looking you know, at, through his uh, uh, CV, I found that um, he is one of the most genuine uh, educators uh, in, the, in, at the, uh, in, the, in this field. Um, now, uh, he will give us the chance to think about the tradition and uh, the change and how to get along with uh, each other uh, by looking you know, at uh, Eton uh, college experience. Uh, and after his speech, uh, we will have uh, time for interaction uh, with him about two, 20 minutes. Okay, now please give him big uh, welcome applause, Mr. Little. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be back in Seoul. As you have heard, I've been asked to speak to you this morning about the balance between keeping education focused on the needs of the present and the future, but also retaining the best of traditional values, because it is my belief that good schools are schools that constantly reevaluate that equation that equation between modern needs and traditional values. And it's only by doing that that we can enable young people to be, to coin a phrase, open and ready for the challenges that lie ahead of them. And I'm going to speak specifically about my experience at Eton College. Uh, Eton College is a school rich in tradition. In the modern age, there are those people, certainly in the United Kingdom, who decry tradition and claim that being connected to history means being shackled to the past. There is danger for any society or community in paying too great a reverence to the way things were in the past at the expense of valuing the present and preparing for the future. Indeed, traditions that hinder progress should go. They should be done away with. But it is my belief that a community such as a school can take great strength from its ethos and educational philosophy refined over many years, and at the same time be dynamic and active in facing the future. This is our aim at Eton College. In this session, I hope to explain something about the Eton mentality, which has led to the development of a successful system of education, but I'd like to stress that there's no one solution, no single approach to education that will work for all young people around the world. At Eton, we always seek to learn from the achievements of others. What follows is an analysis of a philosophy of education that has grown and thrived for 570 years and which has flourished because it stayed faithful to core values whilst changing with the times. First, a little bit about Eton's history. In 1440... King Henry VI founded the King's College of Our Lady of Eton beside Windsor. 
Over the years, this title has been contracted to the simple phrase Eton College. But the original name of the school is important because it reflects the religious motivation behind the foundation. In many ways, King Henry was a weak man and a poor ruler, a bad king. But he was a devout Christian and saw the foundation of the school at Eton and also of King's College at Cambridge University in 1441 as his lasting achievement and legacy, and so it has proved. Attitudes to religion have changed over the centuries, and the school's position has altered too, in part reflecting changes in society. Founded in the Roman Catholic tradition, the school became Anglican during the Protestant Reformation in England in the mid-16th century. The Anglican tradition remains at the heart of school life, but these days... The school also has chaplains and tutors for Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu boys, and boys of other faiths. While happily recognizing and supporting different faiths, it's the significance of spiritual life, the significance of spiritual life, that remains central to the Eton philosophy of education. Eton does not see itself as a factory production line turning out large numbers of units for employment, but rather as a place where a boy can learn to be himself, but also to be more than he thought he could be. We want each boy to have that true sense of self-worth, which will enable him to stand up for himself (coughs) and for a purpose greater than himself, and in doing so, to be of real value to society. (coughs) King Henry intended that his school at Eden should be part of a large community of priests, together with 70 poor scholars who would be educated at his own expense. To that end, he endowed his new school with lands which would provide a substantial income, as well as so-called holy relics. These holy relics, for example, pieces of wood claimed to be parts of the true cross on which Jesus was crucified, have long since disappeared. But the lands in the income have remained, enabling Eton to continue to offer places at the school to boys from poor or less advantaged families. Today, about 250 students are in receipt of significant financial support to enable them to attend the school. Some of these scholarships continue to be funded by King Henry's money, but many more have been the result of generous benefactions by many well-wishers of the school over the years. From the very early days, boys also came to Eton whose parents paid for their boarding and tuition. Thus it was, Eton created an interesting social cocktail of boys from rich and poor families, a mix that continues to this day. While many boys come from comfortable and wealthier families, it's the case that we have boys who come from homes in inner-city tower blocks, as well as castles. Eton is... (coughs) Excuse me. Brief interlude. Eton is unabashed to offer an elite education, encouraging pupils to strive for excellence in everything they do. But as far as it's possible to do so, we want an open elite, a school in which we welcome boys from different social backgrounds, different religions and and nations. This, we believe, is a modern interpretation of the intentions of our founder, and we continue to raise money to pay for more scholarships. This is an important issue for us. We have no interest in providing education only for a narrow band of wealthy families. At this point, I should explain what Eton College is and what it is not. Eton is a boarding school for 1,300 boys aged 13 to 18. Fees are charged to parents to cover both the tuition and the residential costs, In the case of about 20% of the boys, all or part of the fees are paid for them by charitable trusts. Eton receives no money from the government and is financially wholly self-sufficient. In that sense, it is completely independent. No individual or group of individuals takes financial advantage from the operation of the school. Indeed, the school has the status of a legal charity. The teachers and other staff who run the school receive financial payment but final responsibility in the school rests with a board of governors who are not paid a salary and receive no financial gain. 
This is the pattern of organisation of most of the non-government schools in the UK and certainly the most effective and best regarded of them. Eton is an independent school charging fees, yet it does not make a profit. Any planned financial surplus above the operating needs of the school is used to develop facilities further for the use of the pupils or to increase the number of bursaries available. The following images will give you <clears throat> some idea of the Eton context. This building is what's called Lower School. It is the oldest classroom at Eton and dates from 1440. For 570 years, there has been teaching in this space. Of course, Eton has many very modern facilities, but it is valuable to have something so traditional at the heart of the school. That is the chapel, the original place of worship, which was built by King Henry VI in 1479. And inside the chapel are some famous artworks. It's a very old wall painting and a famous tapestry. This is College Hall. This is the first place where the whole community would have met together almost 600 years ago to eat and in some cases to sleep. And College Library, founded around 1600, has within it some famous ancient books. This is one of my favourites. This is called the Eden Songbook, which is an example of the musical notation used before the year 1500. It is a, a wonderful resource, the library, full of great texts from past years. And the traditions continue to live. <clears throat> As you may know, all the students wear a very traditional form of dress. Those are students wearing what they wear for the working day. It's a, a form of dress worn for about 200 years. And the teachers also wear school dress. You see on the left there a teacher talking to a, a student. Eton is one of the very few schools I know where the teachers wear the same uniform, in effect, as the pupils. There's something faintly Maoist about it, I always think. And there we are, somebody you know. And this is a picture of perhaps the most famous view of the school, of School Yard, as it's called, with Lupton's Tower. <coughs> Everything you see built there was built before the year 1500. So Eton has a very strong sense of connection with its past. And the wealth of historic cultural richness is all around students. It not only provides them with educational opportunities, but creates a bond, a living bond with the past. We believe that this bond encourages students to see themselves as part of a continuum, part of something greater than their individual selves. With five and a half centuries of history as an institution, boys at Eton are aware of the achievements of the past, and this helps give them the confidence to approach their own futures in a positive and productive way. We don't teach students about Eton's history, about the boys who became prime ministers, generals, academics, writers, philosophers, or musicians. That would be triumphalist and counterproductive. But tradition is powerful. It asks each boy a question. If so many young men have gone on from here to do remarkable things, why not you? Why not you? Times change, and each generation must interpret for itself the educational values in which it believes, which are relevant in bringing forward the young people who will be leaders of tomorrow. I have spoken already about Eden's relationship with its past, but I will now seek to explain something of the philosophical basis of contemporary Eton. I started my own career as a student at Eton and returned as headmaster in September 2002. After an absence of 30 years, it was most interesting to identify the changes that had taken place during that period of time. Eton now has many wonderful modern facilities and buildings. The range of academic subjects available to boys has dramatically increased. For example, 11 foreign languages are now taught. The work ethic is stronger than it used to be. Boys are now much more aware of the competitive world into which they will go. All this is positive. Eton is a better place than it was in my day. 
But not all is for the better. Changing social attitudes in the country as a whole are reflected at Eton. Respect for authority is less assured. Relationships are more casual. Cynicism is an easy retreat. Belief in anything is less readily stated than ever it was. The challenge to me and my colleagues is to continue to develop the range of modern skills and flexibility our boys will need while reinforcing those traditional values which we believe underpin good education and which properly prepare young people to face their future. To this end, some eight years ago, I invited the 160 masters, that's the teachers, of Eton to join with me in re-evaluating an Eton education. The exercise was stimulating and prompted fresh debate. We also involved parents and boys. The result was a distillation, a refining of our core principles. We restated our belief that Eton will remain a fully residential school, accepting as students only those young people who wish to live as part of a residential community. We restated, too, our belief in Eton as a school for boys only. While there are many very good co-educational schools in the world, Eton's particular expertise and strength is in developing young men. We believe boys and girls can have differing educational needs, and we wish to focus our attention on boys. We reaffirmed our commitment to five key principles, the five principles that underline an Eton education. We said that Eton is a full boarding school committed, in the first place, to promoting the best habits of independent thought and learning in the pursuit of excellence. We see the acquisition of factual knowledge as important, but it's only a small part of learning. It's the zest for knowledge and the desire to inquire that are great attributes for adult life. The ethos of the Eton schoolroom is to encourage students to stretch the boundaries of their individual ability. A strong emphasis is placed on discussion, research, and the use of resources to stimulate independent thinking. We expect students to ask questions and not just answer them. We expect them to challenge their teachers. From the very beginning, each boy has his own study bedroom. There are no shared rooms. Students thus have their own private space and have to organize themselves and to develop self-discipline in meeting tasks and deadlines. There's plenty of adult support, including a housemaster and a personal tutor, but in our experience, if you state clearly that you expect young people to take responsibility for themselves, they will. For example, Eton is a large school spread around a town. There are no bells directing students' time. They learn quickly to work out their schedule and to be punctual. After three years in the school, when a boy is age 16... He chooses his personal tutor from among the teachers. He must take the initiative and ask a teacher to supervise his work and take a special interest in him. This relationship presents further opportunities to explore and develop particular academic and cultural themes and to open up new horizons. The relationship between a student in his later teenage years and his personal tutor often proves to be hugely beneficial in the boy's intellectual and social development. Like any good school, we try to teach some way beyond the usual national examination courses, such as A-level. One way to do this is to encourage boys with academic ambition to compete for one or more of the hundred different academic subject prizes we hold. These are additional voluntary examinations. The papers are set by university teachers and marked by them to university standard. Competitive academic prizes outside the normal exam syllabuses have become a distinctive feature of the way we operate. Second, we are committed to providing a broadly based education designed to enable all students to discover their strengths and to make the most of their talents within Eton and beyond. Academic study is important and we expect all our boys to achieve high standards. But our view of education celebrates the creative, physical and spiritual at least as much as the intellectual. From the beginning of their time in the school, students are given the opportunity to experience a wide range of activities 
and we help them develop their own individual programs. No one activity dominates. We believe it's very important that boys find achievement and recognition in a host of different ways. As sportsmen, musicians or army cadets, as filmmakers or magicians, by creating a new club or through community service. Pursuing an enthusiasm offers a great satisfaction in itself, but by pushing for the highest standards, boys find a fulfillment which can readily translate into other areas of school life. Time and again, I have witnessed a student significantly raise his academic achievement when he has discovered a particular skill in an extracurricular area and been publicly celebrated for it. Many boys develop a richly contrasting portfolio of individual achievement. The international rower also sings in the choir as he prepares to read history at university. The expert in stage lighting is a capable violinist. The concert pianist is a good tennis player and mathematician, and so on. Third, we said we were committed to, to engendering respect for individuality, difference, and the importance of teamwork, and the contribution that each boy makes to the life of the school and community. Eton is a British school with a cosmopolitan atmosphere. Most of our students are drawn to Eton from the length and breadth of the United Kingdom, and smaller numbers come from all around the world. Diversity of religion, nationality, and social background is important. Younger teenagers are often rather tribal, but it is thrilling to see how they learn truly to value differentness as they mature. So, too, we look for diversity in the character and attributes of the boys who come to Eton. All the students live in boarding houses, which comprise the housemaster and his family. Fifty boys aged 13 to 18, and usually four or five other adults. For each student, his boarding house produces a paradigm of society, within which he learns to cope with the different styles of thinking and work with others for the good of a house community. The key to the boarding experience in which I am a great believer, is seeking a spirit of active tolerance, in which listening is as important as verbal assurance, and in which discussion leads to understanding. It's by learning how to judge and develop relationships day by day that most effectively help students become purposeful citizens. We want them to believe that they can make a difference to their own lives and the lives of people around them. The fourth of the five points is that we see ourselves supporting pastoral care that nurtures physical health, emotional maturity, and spiritual richness. A boarding school really works if it is able to achieve a fine equation linking opportunity, risk, and security. The key to it is focusing on relatively small boarding houses, which gives students a strong pastoral base within a large, varied, challenging school. We believe it's essential that boys feel secure within a pastoral community, which is run like an extended family. We see it as a function of masters and other adults in the school to offer boys support and encouragement, helping them through any periods of difficulty or uncertainty, but without intrusion. It's a delicate and important balance. We encourage students to talk about problems with those who can help, but we also encourage them to sort things out for themselves. It is important to make sure that boys are given the space and freedom to develop themselves. This is an easy thing to say, but it takes time, patience, and confidence on the part of teachers. Within the boarding house, senior boys are expected to exercise supportive leadership and to be welcoming and helpful advisors to younger boys. We expect all students to take on a leadership role at some stage, in the operation of his boarding house, by captaining a sports team, by being secretary of a club or society, there are many possibilities. In all their academic and pastoral relationships, we encourage boys to talk comfortably and openly with each other and with adults. It's not always successful, of course. We have our failures. But we spend a great deal of time in private conversation with students. <clears throat> and the fifth and final point... We are committed to fostering self-confidence, 
enthusiasm, perseverance, tolerance, and integrity. Self-confidence without arrogance, enthusiasm unfettered by cynicism, perseverance to withstand setbacks, and active tolerance of others are the qualities we most admire and wish to see in our students. Above all, we wish them to develop their own sense of integrity so that they can identify right from wrong and have the courage to stand by what they believe. Most boys lead very busy, active lives. Indeed, I've yet to visit a school which operates with quite the intensity of Eton. Sometimes the pressure can be tough on a child, but that too is an important lesson. Teenagers have a tremendous capacity to be productive and creative, and it's our responsibility to give them a challenging, supportive environment which enables them to achieve at levels of which they otherwise might not have dreamt. It is a failing of too many schools to see a school education as an end in itself. If we succeed at Eton, it is because we have helped each student build for himself the foundation for a fulfilled life. Once we had defined these five core principles, it struck us that only one of them, only one, explicitly refers to the academic curriculum and thus implicitly to exam performance. That's a fair reflection of Eaton's approach. The focus of the school is on all-round development, and in particular, of character. These core principles are the values that underpin what we are and what we seek to do. In my daily work and on my travels around the world, I come across a range of reactions to Eaton's philosophy of excellence in breadth. Some anxious parents driven by a fear that their child will not achieve a top university place, can become obsessed by academic performance. And it's true that for entry to competitive UK universities, it is a student's public examinations that matter, and only those that matter. So, the argument runs, a fee-paying school like mine will better serve its customers if it concentrates solely on exam grades. Yet at the other end of the scale, I speak with business leaders who bemoan the situation where they are faced with a growing pile of candidates for jobs who have excellent academic credentials but little else to recommend them. Some years ago, I conducted a survey of business leaders in the UK. The survey identified three principal failings of well-qualified graduates presenting themselves for employment. And these three failures were a lack of initiative, low ability to work effectively in teams, and poor oral communication. In conversations with a highly successful British business leader as part of this project, he described the particular virtues most likely to lead to success in the business world as enthusiasm, energy, and endurance. Academic ability and technical skill he took as the baseline, no more than that. <clears throat> I tell my boys at Eton that they need to understand and engage in Orwellian doublethink. George Orwell, who wrote the books Animal Farm in 1984, was the old Etonian novelist who coined the term doublethink, meaning to hold two contradictory ideas in one's head at the same time and believe both of them. The doublethink our students need today is that in order to win a place at a top university, at least in the UK, the only thing that matters is academic performance and exam grades. But, once they leave university, what then matters is all the things that were experienced and achieved outside the classroom, outside the classroom. Without breadth in schooling, true excellence is planted in thin soil, and I believe it will not flourish and grow. Well-rounded, confident, determined, articulate young people are capable of success in whichever sphere of activity they wish to engage. Let me turn now to give a few more practical examples of how we attempt to embody our principles in the routines and currency of daily school life. In doing so, it's important to stress two key complementary areas, the pastoral and the curricular. When I visit schools around the world, including boarding schools, I often come across institutions that are efficient providers of academic courses, 
sometimes with good games or arts programs in addition, but seldom do I see a really effective pastoral community. In my view, effective pastoral care is the foundation stone of an excellent school. All other aspirations that the school may have for its pupils follow from the care, guidance, and active support of the professional adults who create the atmosphere in which young people will develop themselves and will flourish. By pastoral care, I don't just mean the provision of basic necessities and a system of discipline, but an all-embracing concern for each pupil in every aspect of their personal development. It is about spending time investing in relationships. It is an holistic approach to education. It is total pastoral care. Eton works because on the one hand it has the economy of scale and range of choice of a large school, but on the other hand it is broken down into small, strong pastoral units. Our 1,300 students are divided into 25 different boarding houses. College is the name of the boarding house for the 70 scholars King Henry originally prescribed. All the other boys are divided into 24 houses with about 50 boys in each house. There are thus typically 10 boys aged 13, 10 boys aged 14, 10 boys aged 15, and so on, in each house. And the boys have a very strong loyalty to their particular house. Each house is the personal responsibility of a housemaster, an experienced senior master, who lives with his own family, with the boys. In addition, each house also has a professional person who runs the domestic side of the house, still known by the old-fashioned term dame. There are other masters and support staff attached to each house, but it is the housemaster and dame who are the focal point of the boys' lives at school. It's important that the housemaster feels a very strong personal responsibility to his boys, and it takes exceptional people, it takes the very best teachers to fulfill the exacting demands of this role well. I like the Eton tradition whereby the houses are not known by the name of a building. The houses are known by the name of a housemaster. So as a student, you belong to Mr. Smith's house or Mr. Jones's house. It is a personal human relationship. Appointing first-rate housemasters is one of my principal challenges and tasks. These are the most influential teachers in my school, not the academic heads of departments, important though they are. <coughs> to give you a little more idea about the house system and why it is so important at Eton, uh, that is one house. That is actually a, a house known as... Mr. Grenier's, the housemaster, is someone called Michael Grenier. That's his house. He has 50 students living with him in that building. And that's his house. He's there in the middle of the front row. Mr. Grenier looks quite young. Sitting next to him, on the right-hand side as you look at it, that's his wife. On the left-hand side, that is the dame, a lady called Rosemary Erickson, who's responsible for the domestic side of the life. And all those boys form one community. They will live together for five years from age 13 to 18. And they will get to know each other extremely well. And the house identity is further shown. Each house has its own flag. It's very tribal. That's the house garden. It's the housemaster's garden. But it's understood that the boys share it as well. It is part of an extended family. Houses run their own sports fixtures. That's one house team having won something or other. They look very scruffy, typical teenagers. In the same way that the totality of pastoral care is essential, so too is the need for a curriculum that embraces all facets of a boy's development. Etonians are expected to work hard and achieve good academic results, but they're also expected to be fully and purposefully involved in a wide range of activities. There is a maximum of only 23 hours of taught time during the working week, which is about one-third of the available time. I believe that the lasting skills that make young people successful well into their adult lives are learnt and developed at least as much outside the classroom as inside it. The Duke of Wellington is famously, and probably apocryphally, supposed to have said that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton not in the classroom. 
We continue to stress the virtues of purposeful activity outside the classroom, in particular regular involvement in sports, which develops good health, leadership and team spirit. Six days each week we make time over for sport, although not all boys will be playing sport every day. Much of the sport Eton boys play is also played by other schools around the world, such as soccer or rugby or basketball, all the usual games. But what is unusual at Eton, and we believe important, is that we sustain traditional games which were invented at Eton and which are wholly amateur and not played much anywhere else. And the important thing is they have no professional role model. And these games are games like the field game and the wall game. The field game is the mass participation sport at Eton. All boys play it. It's organized by the houses. One house competes against another. More than any other sport or activity, the field game helps teach boys about the joy of participation and engaging in something for its own sake, not for public recognition. In an age of increasing professionalism, these unique games are an antidote. They offer a good example of traditional practice which has, I believe, a surprising modern relevance. These traditional games have gone on for many years. This is an old painting, it's about 150 years old, of boys at Eton playing a game known as the wall game, which they developed themselves. And it's still played now. It is played literally against a wall, the wall to the right. And it's a very physical game. It is I have to say, it's a particularly bad game to watch. It's a bad spectator sport, but it's good to play. There's a shot from above. Good physical stuff. But the boys take it very seriously. It means a lot to them. A different game is a game called the field game. There's a shot of that. That's two houses, one against the other. And that is more of a football game. It's a, it is a game that was invented before soccer. Soccer grew out of this game. So this is an old form of soccer. If any of you are soccer addicts, it's one of those surprising quirks of history that Eton College actually won the FA Cup twice, once in 1879 and once in 1882. Not quite Manchester United, but not far off. And the third of the three games invented at Eton is a handball game called Fives, which was originally played between the buttresses of, of the chapel. And again, it is played by a great many boys. Traditional activities find many forms. The fourth one I'm going to show you is, involves rowing, which is a big sport at Eton. Once a year, all the boys who row are involved in a well-known tradition called the 4th of June, which is a celebration day, when they dress in a very particular and peculiar way. There. They are wearing uniforms from 150 years ago, 200 years ago. This event started in the year 1790. And it's traditional to have flowers in your hat, which at a certain point are then thrown into the water as you pass. It's colourful. It's also, of course, absurd. And my reason for keeping this image on the screen is that it is an image it's very easy to dismiss because it is so old-fashioned and seems to have no value or purpose. And yet, part of what I'm saying is that these traditional expressions which young people can feel connected to have a modern value and help underpin the educational philosophy of a school which is trying to prepare young people for the challenges they're going to inherit. In other words, I don't see this as an anachronism. It's a feature of the modern Eton that equal emphasis is also given to music, creative arts, cadet force, community service, many other events and activities. If a boy suggests an activity which the school does not offer, we do our best to introduce it. Our motivation is to support each boy's enthusiasm. One example of an Eton tradition that has modern relevance is the operation of societies. A society may be formed at any time to represent an interest, from history to fly fishing. Some societies are of long standing. The political society is almost 200 years old. Others come and go as enthusiasm kindles and wanes. Society meetings usually involve inviting a distinguished speaker to speak to boys and then engage in a question and answer session. They take place in the evening. Thus far, this sounds a description of a program that might be found in any school. But there are two major distinctive features 
First, scale. There will typically be over 200 individual society meetings with a visiting speaker during the academic year. Second, and more importantly, all these societies are run by students, and all the arrangements are made by students. So it is normal for a 17-year-old boy to invite a leading politician or a university professor or a famous actor, and for him to arrange the dinner, to organize the venue, to take charge of the meeting, to look after the whole event. As far as we can, we try to arrange our curriculum so as to give students the opportunity to take the lead. We also encourage boys to show leadership in the schoolroom. While part of, their, part of the art of a good teacher is to impart knowledge, the real skill is to create a schoolroom culture in which students willingly take responsible, responsibility for their own learning and a climate in which all students feel able to challenge ideas and opinions. Underlying this approach is what I've already described as active tolerance. The word tolerance suggests a sympathetic awareness of the other person's point of view, but this does not mean a tacit acceptance of that view. Active engagement is crucial. Young people need to sharpen their intellects and shape their own views through challenging others and being challenged. The schoolroom should be a focus of, focus of studious calm on the one hand, but it should also be a place of lively debate and argument. I believe this spirit of active tolerance will inform learning in good schools long after our current perception of the classroom has changed. Technology is developing at a fast race, pace, and the experience of being a student in a school will be different. I envisage brighter, more flexible learning spaces, spaces that genuinely promote face-to-face -face connection between students and their teachers. Students will be able to contribute and amend the work of a group using digital tools such as collaborative documents and mind mapping software that allows groups to work on a project in real time. These tools should never replace face-to-face -face discussion and argument in a schoolroom, but they open up new avenues for student voices to be heard. In future, individual schoolrooms will be fully linked with the great advances in speed of operation of technologies. Facilities such as supervised video and on-demand internet access will liberate more time for group discussion. Third or fourth generation tablet style devices will enable students to carry the latest e-books for each subject a student has chosen to take. Both students and teachers will be able to create their own portfolio of new apps that will enhance their own day-to-day -day work. This approach will appeal particularly to visual and auditory learners. Academic departments will be able to make course materials immediately available to students with updated assignments loaded automatically perhaps synchronized as students physically leave or enter the building. In 10 years' time, a truly open web for learning will be a fact of life. Opportunities will open up to use new technology for informal learning with schools, perhaps arranging blocks of enrichment time in which students can follow courses of their own choosing, connecting with an expert online. In some notable ways, the function of the teacher will change as will his relationship with the student. He will be much more of a guide and an enabler, much less the director. The practice of teacher-led, teacher-dominated lessons that I see in many parts of the world will soon be redundant. The sometimes staid and unrewarding approach to the professional development of teachers we see today will change. Communities of passionate teachers will communicate and collaborate online across the globe but I believe face-to-face -face contact and meetings will, as a consequence, be seen as even more important than ever. Technological ease of communication will stimulate the idea that it will be essential for teachers to engage with each other professionally, and this is essential if we are to give our students the guidance they will need in a hugely complex world. Some critics claim a virtual world of education may even replace schools in the future. They're wrong. Living communities of people, of students and teachers, are the only way to develop the human values that make a civilization civilized. If technology can replace a teacher, then it should do so. 
because teachers will be liberated to focus on the individual needs of their students. Good teachers will always offer far more than technology ever can. As I've already explained, Eton is a fully residential boarding school. Most schools in the UK are non-residential day schools, but the English boarding school tradition is distinctive and offers particular qualities in education. I have been fortunate to visit many schools at home and abroad. Usually I find boarding houses are run by enthusiastic young people, sometimes not even teachers. It seems to me crucial that the people who lead boarding houses should be the best, most experienced teachers. They have a great legal and moral responsibility placed on them, but more than that, I believe, they need to have considerable understanding to appreciate a key truth of school education, that young people learn more from each other than they do from adults. It takes considerable skill to create the environment in which this peer learning takes place effectively and well. With good house mastering, one cr can create an excellent boarding school. Boarding schools are able to give more time than day schools through the day and the week to develop a full program. By their nature, they have to stress the value of community. They stimulate social awareness. They allow strong bonds of friendship to grow. And crucial in an effective boarding school, students learn to take responsibility. Students learn that the way they behave every hour of the day is what brings them the respect of other people. They learn that respect is not automatic, that it has to be earned. In short, they learn how to show leadership. The modern world experiences many social tensions and problems. I believe good boarding schools have the potential to help create solutions for these problems by using their unique residential environment to develop balanced young people who have a social conscience and the ability to take a lead. Indeed, it can be argued that boarding schools are more relevant to social progress now than they have ever been. I am encouraged that in the UK there has been a recent upswing of interest in boarding as a viable, effective, modern approach for state schools. In the past, I also have been headmaster of a non-residential school. In some respects, being responsible for young people 24 hours a day, seven days a week is demanding. But in another sense, having your pupils with you all the time makes the job of teachers easier. In a residential environment, we have the opportunity to influence behavior and habits in a profound way. The challenge in a non-residential school is to find ways to develop a culture which young people see as one of the central elements of their lives and which influences them in all aspects of their dealings with people. In the end, moral principle counts for far more than academic excellence. We should aim that our young people will have the energy, enthusiasm and endurance to be successful in their working careers, but also that they should have the self-confidence and purpose to be good citizens in our closely connected global community. I've shown something of the Eton approach to education and sought to explain the philosophical principles that inform that approach. As I indicated earlier, we constantly review what we do and the way we do it. Great institutions survive because they're based on sound principles and traditional values. They thrive because they never become complacent and remain sensitive to the needs of the present and make a judgment about the demands of the future. At root, I have one firm and immovable belief. It is well expressed by an Eton master who wrote about education at Eton in the year 1869. His name was William Corey, and he wrote that a boy may acquire a certain amount of knowledge at school, much of which may well be forgotten, although the shadow of lost knowledge at least will protect him from many illusions, but more important than knowledge, far more important than knowledge, is learning the arts and habits which will last for a lifetime. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, uh, this precious uh, presentation, uh, Mr. Little. 
And um, I really uh, was impressed by the, um, the Eaton example to show that uh, uh, that connect uh, the young pupils with uh, the tradition and histories. And also, as a mother of, with uh, three kids, uh, two of them are young boys at uh, secondary schools. Uh, I'm really, you know, envious of uh, the pupils at uh, Eton schools, Eton school, and also, frankly speaking, I'm kind of jealous of of him. So there is uh, now it's um, time uh, to interact with him uh, by asking questions or uh, saying comments. So uh, if you have questions or comments, please raise hands and uh, say your name before you know ask questions. Okay. Okay. The lady, this man, this uh, gentleman, this is Mike. Thank you for your very meaningful and insightful uh, speech. I was very impressed to hear it. Well, I'm, my name is Ji Hwan Yoon from the Korea University Business School, and I have two questions to make. Well. Korea's, pre Korea's prestigious schools are in the controversial state because journalists and some NGOs are blaming Korean schools that they are just too prestigious and they are requesting too much tuitions and that are only available to some rich ones in Korea. So Korea's schools are also very vulnerable to those pressures from outside that they should abolish their policies and traditions and degrade them to the level of the common public schools. So, Mr. Lito, I have two questions. Well, I'm curious how do you keep your, and save your traditions from the pressures outside if they resist? And the second one is, what would you recommend for Korean prestigious schools to resolve this phenomenon? Thank you. Thank you. I said early on in my talk that if a tradition is hindering progress, it should go. i give some examples from Eton College. One that springs to mind is that there used to be a long-standing tradition that every time there was a set of examinations within the school, a rank order would be produced for, the whole of the for all the students in one year, 260 students, and they would be read out in public, starting with a boy who finished bottom and going through to the void, finished top. Now, we've dispensed with that tradition because we felt it was counterproductive. It made some students feel very bad. It made other students feel complacent. It was a tradition that did not have value, so it goes. The reason I'm saying this is because the traditions that we keep, we believe, significantly enhance what we are offering. In other words, tradition is not a break on achieving the results that parents and governments want. Tradition, when it is refined and focused, is a very powerful tool. And this is partly because teenagers especially are very conservative, conservative with a small c. They think in traditional lines. They like to break rules, of course, because that's part of being a teenager. But at heart, they respond to values and traditions that are deep-rooted. And we find that by refining tradition, we are able to improve results. And that's, if you like, that is the bottom line. It is a false argument. It is a false dichotomy to say that tradition stands in the way of good results. Next, the lady. Um, thank you so much for your in inspirational speech. And uh, my name is Unji Lee, and I work for Ministry of Education, Science, and Technology. Um, so, as some so as someone who was also educated in a single-sex institution myself. I was very intrigued by your comment that girls and boys, boys and girls have differing educational needs. And not only in the West, but also in Korea, they, 
the general consensus is that a single sex uh, education is something more obsolete than something that's seen as um, something that is uh, rather an enduring tradition. And um, I would like to hear more about your thoughts on the strength of single sex in education at Eton College. It's a very interesting area for discussion, this, I think. Because it is also the case in the UK that the default position is that co-education is normal. The idea is that it reflects real life. You know, men and women together, boys and girls together, they learn how to get on. My previous school, the school of which I was headmaster, was a good co-educational school. 50% girls, 50% boys. And it was an area that I had become used to. What has surprised me coming back to a single-sex school is how many benefits there are. Now, I do not stand here as uh, an apostle saying single-sex schools are good, co-education is bad. It's not as simple as that. Good co-educational schools are valuable, so are good single-sex schools. But i give you some examples of where I have been struck that single-sex works for boys. It makes the operation of choice of subject easier. In a co-educational school, you will find it is mainly girls who will study literature, and it's mainly boys who will study physics. It becomes related to gender. In a boys' school like Eton College, there are many students who choose to take courses in literature without it being a problem or an issue. I'll give you another example. We have a symphony orchestra of 70 players. In my last school, pretty much all the violins were girls. In a boys' school, boys play the violin. It's not an issue. When it comes to theatre, to my surprise, I have seen more emotional honesty on stage in an all-boys production when boys are playing across gender. So boys have to learn how to think and behave on stage in a female role, which you would never find in a co-educational school. So there are many quite subtle ways in which I think students can be helped to develop themselves without having the other pressure of having the, the other gender with them. All that girlfriend stuff, boyfriend stuff. It's put to one side so you can focus on what you are doing in school. I would say that I have visited some very bad boys' schools. And to me, a bad boys' school is one that plays to all the stereotypes of maleness. It's only sport. They're only interested in doing you know, heavy-handed things. And that seems to me bad because it is underlining the worst aspects of maleness. But in a good boys' school, a school that cherishes music and art and drama, young teenage boys can learn to express themselves unhindered in a way that is very difficult to achieve in a co-educational school. Some thoughts, anyway. Okay, next. The gentleman. Yes, I don't want to ask the English question, so I'll give you a Korean word. 저는 지금 목동에서 수학 학원을 운영하고 있습니다. 예, 네, 수학 학원을 운영하면서 느낀 게 뭐냐면 좀 전에 말씀하신 대로 지금 교장 선생님께서 말씀하신 대로 한국은 지금 60년 만에 대단히 많이 성장을 했지만 겉으로 보는 뭔가 이제 소프트웨어적인 면이 좀 다른 것 같습니다. 지금 아이들은 이제 석차에 이제 나뉘어져서 일명 서울대, 연고대 이렇게 스카이라고 해서 서울 안에 있는 유명 대학을 가기 위해서 학문적인 공부, 그러니까 지식 공부는 상당히 많이 하고 있습니다. 근데 그 외적인 공부는 이제 경험이라든지 뭐 학교 밖에서 배우는 거든지 또는 토론이라든지 이런 거는 지금 한국에서는 되게 취약하고 또 학부모들은 그거보다는 일단 상위권 대학에 가는 걸 원하고 있어요. 그래서 그것 때문에 이제 스펙을 쌓고 뭐 토플이든 토익이든 어렸을 때부터 많이 그런 학업 스트레스를 받다 보니까 그 외적인 여가 활동이라든지 뭐 문화 생활이라든지 이런 걸 지금 할수 있는 여건이 조성이 되고 있지 않고 있어요. 그래서 지금 요즘에 제일 많이 이슈가 되는 게 저도 고민을 하고 있는 게 이제 인성교육 부분이 상당히 고민을 지금 많이 하고 있습니다. 근데 뭐 공교육이든 사교육이든 어디 쪽에서도 지금 인성교육에 대한 포커스를 맞추고 있는 부분은 되게 취약하고 있는 상황이고요. 
저도 이제 최근에 이제 뭐 경영인들하고 이렇게 만날 기회가 있어서 이제 공부를 하게 됐는데 인문학이나 철학 이런 부분이 사실은 이제 학생들한테 뿌리를 내릴 수 있는 아주 좋은 지식들인데 그쪽은 약간 관가되고 있고 오히려 수학, 영어 이쪽에 이제 많이 포커스를 맞춰줘서 지식만 갖고 있습니다. 그래서 대학을 졸업하고 나서도 취업 문제 때 그런 이제 어떻게 보면 기초 학문이 부족해서 나중에 이제 창의적인 아이디어를 찾아내는 데에서 많은 어려움을 지금 겪고 있는데 이튼 스쿨은 참 그걸 좀 잘하고 있어서 되게 부럽기도 하고 한국 학부모들한테 그럼 어떻게 하면 그 교과적인 부분하고 인성교육 부분하고 아니면 그 여가 활동을 이렇게 동시에 같이 나갈 수 있게끔 할수 있는 어떤 뭐 비전을 줄수 있다면 그런 거에 대해서 좀 알고 싶고요. 그 다음에 이튼 스쿨이 이렇게 오랫동안 이제 학교를 유지하는 원동력은 무엇이라고 생각하는지 좀 알고 싶습니다. I understand the points you make, and each country, each culture will have different pressures. There is only one way, I believe, in which you can have that balance of character education and achieve high results. And it is by convincing parents, because in the end it's the parents who will exert the pressure, <clears throat> by convincing parents that you can do both. If there is a perception that in giving time to a broad range of activities, in giving time to character development, you reduce the chance to get into a top university, then you have a very big battle. And I can understand the nature of the difficulty. But uh, my point is this. The UK is also a very competitive environment. It is now extremely difficult to get into the top universities, particularly in the last few years, because there are cutbacks, and there are going to be more cutbacks. So it's very competitive. It is still the case, in spite of increased competition, that at least one-third of the students of Eton College will be successful to go to Oxford and Cambridge universities, and uh, another great chunk of them will go to American universities. I'm very well aware that my students have to be successful in their university placements because that is, in the end, what parents are most concerned about. But what we have undertaken to do in my school is to achieve that through what we do in the total curriculum. In other words, I think from where we are now, if we withdrew and focused only on the academic, I actually believe our results would go down. It is a question of having belief that the time you invest in other activities, in development of character, is not simply some nice, fluffy, extra thing you put on the edge. It's something that's hard-edged and has real value and can increase results. Why? Because what you're encouraging young people to do is take responsibility for themselves. And it is difficult. I said this earlier on in my talk. Sometimes teachers can be very nervous. You, you have the focus of exams and you need to get results. And you have to have the confidence to take time out to do these other things, to believe that although it takes a little longer, there's not the short-term gain, that by spending the time on your students as individuals to get them to the position where they take responsibility for their own learning... That, in the end, produces better results, and better results that go longer into the future as well. I'm sorry I can't give you a simple answer, because there is no simple answer. It, it is a complex, complex thing. Now, the other question you asked, how it is that Eton has survived for 570 years, I would like to say it has been down to the genius of successive headmasters. Actually, I suspect it's good luck. Thank you for your valuable thought. And uh, my name is Jin Sung Kim from Hana Academy Seoul in Seoul, Eunpyeong, uh, Newtown area. And uh, you mentioned about the uh, many uh, areas uh, regarding to the uh, changes, uh, and there are many different areas, obviously, uh, which requires different approach. So um, is there any uh, particular area that you want to keep the most or that should be maintained? 
That's a short question. And uh, regarding to the, uh, the uh, question about the uh, gentleman back there, the HANA Academy Seoul is newly established, and uh, we are trying to do something else that other schools couldn't do so far. Thank you. In the panel discussion in which I participated yesterday, I was interested that the participants were broadly saying the same thing. And it was expressing a concern that in the interconnected, globalized society, the lingua franca, the common language, has become the language of economics, of measurement, and of mathematics. Those are the, that's the language that people around the world most easily understand. But there is a great danger here. And the danger is that we begin to value people in those terms, in terms of economics or mathematics, the measurable things. So in answer to your question, what I would most defend in my school is cultural life. Life that is expressed through the creativity of music, through art, through forms of theatre, because it is enabling young people to open up a very important part of their character, but also of their intellectual and emotional development. If we allow a globalised society to dictate that what matters in the education of young people is the mathematically quantifiable, then we run the risk of producing generations of stunted, lopsided young people. Now, if we want our children to be happy and fulfilled and successful in a very fast-changing world, and we can't begin to predict what the job opportunities are going to be for our children. I have a 25-year-old. I have no idea what the world will hold for her. But what is important is that they have the breadth of education, they have that broad foundation of character, which is going to enable them to be adaptable, to move from one thing to another. If we limit our educational focus, and this is what concerns me most, if we limit our educational focus, we will limit the lives of our children. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Ji Young Kim, uh, working for Munich Reinsurance Company as a HR manager. Uh, but I'm here as a mother of a boy and a girl, and listening to you, uh, first I was impressed of the, your comment about space and freedom to develop themselves. Because um, I live in a suburb like one and a half hour from the Seoul, and we move there just for different educations. So like country elementary school, there is uh, nothing forceful. Even my boy is uh, seven years old, but could not read Korean yet. Mm. Uh, but sometimes I have a fear that even I choose their life when they are very young. But what I heard from the older people whose children is already high school, they say they, they regret. Um, they do not start this academic enforcement all these days. What they are saying is that uh, which high school you go, it uh, decides on the life in university. Which university you go, it decides on your peer groups in the rest of your life. I think that's the fear of the parents all the time. They start from the right, like uh, focusing on character and uh, try to give more freedom, let them <laughs> control their life. But then we just back to the, what society wants. Mm. Um, that was the comment I want to make. Uh, my question is, um, in Eton School, uh, there are real traditions uh, based on the richness from the past, but what if you say there are several, uh, the number of people from around the world as well? And since Eton School is so strongly based on the UK traditions, mm -hmm. and how these um, non-UK students can really adapt to this tradition, because they also have their own tradition. So I'm kind of curious, uh, um, other programs uh, to observe the uh, traditions from different countries and how they can actually adapt to each other? It's a very interesting point. Thank you for that question. About 10% of the students at Eton College are non-British. 
but 90% are British. But today, what constitutes being British is much more mixed than it was 30 years ago. So, for example, we have many students who are Indian British or Chinese British or whatever. So there is a greater diversity and mix of culture in the school than there was when I was a student there in the 1960s, when it was much more Anglo-Saxon. Two answers to your question. The first is that as a consequence of Eton College now being much more globally aware, I think most, students, uh, most schools around the world are much more conscious of the world to connect with, that the students themselves are much more inclined to wish to find out more about other cultures and other societies. That's the first point, is a greater openness. But the second point is, I think, more subtle. And it's this, that even if you come from a different culture in a different country, the culture within Eton College is specific to Eton College. I mean, it is related to English culture in a way. But most English people would find the traditions and culture of Eton College strange. And if I was to do this talk to a room full of English people, they would have the same reactions probably as you. So it doesn't matter whether you are uh, American or Korean or from Thailand or wherever it may be, if you are part of the school community, you learn the traditions that create identity for that community. I'll give you one very small example. It's a trivial example. As you saw, we wear very old-fashioned clothes for the working day. Incidentally, in case you get the thought that all the boys wear formal clothes all the time, of course they don't. For large parts of the day, they're wearing jeans and T-shirt. But the formal dress is this very old-fashioned black long coat with a gown. It doesn't matter whether you're American or Korean or whether you come from a rich family or from a poor family in London. Once you wear this uniform, you belong. You are part of that tradition and part of that community. And one of the things I like about Eden is that the students are very welcoming of other types of, of people. It actually does work pretty well. I think young people generally are welcoming. They're rather better at it than adults, in fact. So my answer to your question really is that the traditions I talk about are unique and specific to the school. So it doesn't matter where you come from. You can learn something about the value of, of that tradition. Okay, I think this will be the last one because he has to leave at 1020 to UK. So, okay, this is a, your, our last question. Okay. Thank you for your great ideas. I'm a student at KAIST, majoring in electrical engineering. And I think it's a really special case that you were once a student in the Eton College in the 1960s and you have some experience on outside, and now you became the, the headmaster of the Eton College. There must be some points that we should keep, keep going, like the tradition, the main theme of the school, but there must be also things to change as time goes by, as the social media gets bigger, as the, as the new technology comes out. So I want to I wanna hear, I want to hear the points, the main big points that we should never change, and also some points that we should change with the trend or as time goes by. Thank you. I don't think there is one specific point that you can change or alter, but what I would say is that I think it is very important that each school spends proper time identifying and refining what it believes are the, the underlying principles, the core values, what the school is aiming to do. And this may be different for each school, because each school has... I believe, incidentally, referring to a question somebody asked uh, earlier on, that the best national school system is a school system in which each school is, as it were, independent. Each school is able to create its own ethos and identity. Uh, I am deeply suspicious in the UK of template government solutions because you tend to depress strength and vitality. In making everything the same, you remove creative development. So each school has, should have its own special character, its own particular ethos. And once you've defined it, you, you must fight. You, <laughs> you fight at the barricades to sustain those particular values and principles. That's what matters. 
And we have a planning process at Eton College, which we go through every year, in which the teachers participate and the senior managers, when all the plans for development, whether it's in technology or different programs or different ways of doing things, every time we have a proposal, we take it back to those core principles and say, does this actually improve what we're seeking to do with our values here? And if it doesn't, then there's something wrong. Okay. Uh, that's now <clears throat> our time is almost over. So uh, I'm very sorry to have, uh, that we have uh, this uh, short you know, time uh, to talk and to discuss. Uh, uh, but uh, we have great opportunity to travel uh, the past and present and the, the, the future in, in, in the world of education. Uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation, Mr. Leader, and uh, for audience who participate, uh, uh, participated uh, this discuss discussion very actively. Thank you very much.